I would like to open the stage for our wonderful facilitator for today, Alessa Millet. Alessa is a business coach and a consulting, a consultant helping founders and leadership teams gain clarity, vision, and control in their organization through the implementation of a proven business operating system. Her expertise lies in a 15 plus uh, 15 uh, years career history in sales and marketing at Fortune 500s like Nike, Unilever, Walmart, as well as first-hand experience growing a successful startup. Alyssa is a business mentor with the Toronto Board of Trade, as well as numerous other enterprise centers and chambers of con commerce throughout Ontario. Alyssa, thank you so much for leading the workshop today, and I welcome you to begin the workshop. Thank you. Thanks for the intro. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thanks for everyone who wrote what their companies do. Feel free to pop those in the chat. I may not be able to read as quickly as I would like while I'm presenting, but it's always nice to know what everyone does. It gives me some context, too. Um, so thanks for having me, everyone. So I'm going to turn on my screen and we'll start chatting. Business operating systems. Okay. Let me know if everyone can see this okay. Yeah, awesome. Yay. Okay, great. Okay, so what is a business operating system? You may have heard of a few popular ones, and I'll get into that in a moment of what the one that I most frequently work with with clients, but every business is a snowflake, and I think it's up to each business to determine what business operating system theoretically feels best to them. But I work with one in particular, most commonly, it's called EOS, and it's from the book Traction by Gino Wickman. So if anyone's heard of that, woo woo, shout out. If you haven't, uh, that is okay. I will give you a 101 introduction to it, the value of it, um, and how it can really change and or help you exponentially grow your business. So overarchingly, a business operating system, I describe it as a strategic playbook on how to manage your business. And that means, in terms of running your business, but also managing your people. So it's that overarching structure and strategy that you use as a business owner to steer, operate, and move your ship along in a successful, optimized way. In more detail, I like to give it a bit of a playbook reference like sports. So it really is a series of defined structures and methodologies to help you run your business. You as an entrepreneur and as a leader, especially if you've already been running your business for a little while, you start to develop ebbs and flows of how you do things. You've read lots of books, you've talked to people, you've worked with mentors, and you have a way of running your business. But sometimes business owners get to a point where they've hit a growth ceiling and they find that they need something a little more structured and a little more defined to help them rise up out of their business out of the weeds, I like to call it, empower their team so they can really become the visionary that sits above their business, working on their business versus someone toiling away in the business itself. So when you're an entrepreneur and you're first starting and everyone's wearing all the hats, you can do that. But pretty, pretty quickly, most founders find as they're growing, they start to get trapped in the swamp, like they're a dinosaur stuck in it, kind of like, how do I get out of this? Why is no one else doing all the things? Um, and so a business operating system gives you tools and practices to empower yourself to get out and to empower the team underneath you, the growing team underneath you to be operating at optimum capacity. It ensures that everyone's on the same page always. So everyone has clarity and an understanding of what your vision is as a company, how you achieve that vision and how you actually go about operating and doing the thing you get paid to do. You're a machine, your business is a machine. You either are pumping out a service or a product. And so it's important that the machine is working as well as it possibly can. And finally, it invites you as a leader to establish a series of expectations, clear processes, and accountability that are clearly defined so everyone on your team is in sync. And there's lots of different analogies of this. I like the well-oiled machine reference. EOS likes to use um, rowing in the same direction or all, everyone's swimming upstream. So pick your analogy, it's, have a party with it. But it's that everyone's singing the same tune, moving in the same direction in a confident and clear way. So when is a business operating system most helpful? These are some of the key 
points that I like to highlight to, to founders when they're at a point where they really do and could really benefit from establishing a clearer business operating system and maybe adopting something like EOS that is very uh, formulaic and defined versus doing kind of the, the things they've been feeling around for for the last X number of years versus if they're spending the majority of their time working in the business versus on your business. If you can't extract yourself and take a vacation once in a while, if you can't um, have someone else manage a function or a facet of your business without you, then you're probably spending more time working in your business than actually on your business. Also, as a leader or a visionary of the organization, you eventually need to be the one to steer the ship. And if no one is actually steering and everyone's just rowing away and pulling up the sails, you know, the ship's going to go all over the place and not have a clear direction. You won't get to your final destination very effectively. You want to, if you have a strategic long-term vision um, and defined action steps that will help you get there. So everyone likes to have a bit of a business plan. I'm sure everyone does. If you've started your business, you have a business plan, but a good boss, and I will refer to it a BOS as a boss or a business operating system. I say boss because it's easier. Um, a good boss will invite you to make very clear long-term um, you know, goals and metrics. Everything from 10 years to three years to one year. And define steps that help you get there. It's also helpful when um, owners need to move out of their day-to-day -day operations. So it gets you, again, out of the weeds, out of the doing, and more of the uh, visioning and leading. It also helps, and it's structured, to create an empowered team where there's really clear roles and very clear responsibilities to ensure accountability and productivity. As a leader, you want your team to be autonomous. You want them to work independently and be creative and have their own thoughts and actually be a real contributing team player versus just doing what they're told. But you can let people do that, but it's also important to have a level of um, accountability and to hold them accountable to certain metrics and growth goals and targets. So it's that fine combination between offering someone empowerment and autonomous support versus holding them accountable to real deliverables. And that's where a business operating system will really help you um, anchor that with your team. And finally, one of the, the biggest things that I find business owners will say to me is that they can't do business development stuff. They can't move their business globally to the US or try to sell their product in China because urgent stuff is always trumping what's important. They have a to-do list of ideal growth initiatives that go to the back burner every day because they're too busy just doing what's needed in that moment to get the product out, to do the service for their clients, and fight fires with their teams. And so it's really important that there's a solution in play that doesn't get you to that stage. Especially when you're starting and you're a earlier stage company, knowing how to prevent ever getting in that rut will do you a real service moving forward. So what kind of problems does a business operating system solve? So one is that the important actions and plans sit on a back burner, as I mentioned. You have this laundry list of stuff that just doesn't get done. And maybe you have weekly team meetings with your teams and you always end up just talking in circles, like no solutions ever seem to come out of your team meetings. And so there's a way to do those more effectively that will help be more solution oriented. Another issue that it solves is that owners, again, don't have time or space to do the real work that drives the business forward. And we'll talk in a minute about internal and external growth because there's two different types of business growth. But if you're not growing, you're dying. Like people, like anybody, like plants. It's important that you keep moving forward, whether it's internal growth or external. It solves problems of day-to-day -day tasks, cannibalizing your sales and growth opportunities because you're too busy doing versus driving new business. It ensures that you have a laundry list that's actually prioritized. So it's not this messy dump of brainstorming that sits on a whiteboard somewhere in your uh, conference room and you just walk by it like with, with, a, with a head hung low being like, God, I need to do something on that list. It invites you to actually prioritize those initiatives and get your team going on them quickly. And finally, it helps to solve the struggle of a team that doesn't feel empowered. So it's this nice combination of making sure your team's empowered, but also keeping a pulse on productivity as an owner. So what kind of results happen if a real, uh, an effective boss 
like EOS is implemented in a business. And, and I'll get into it in more detail after. Implementing a business operating system is not a half done initiative. You can see some results if you do bits and pieces of it, but you're not seeing the whole effect if you're not giving it time to actually work and be fully integrated into your business. And it needs time for you and your team to live and breathe the new processes, usually from six months to a year before you're seeing real results in terms of internal and external growth. So the results include though, you know, identifying and solving systematic issues that are holding you back. One of the primary tools, and I'll get into this, of EOS, for example, and a good business operating system is to actually spend time each week solving problems, both at a leadership level and at a functional level. So you're actually prioritizing on a weekly basis, spending an hour with your team, solving the problems that are preventing you from moving forward and achieving your goal. It invites you to prioritize actions to achieve your vision so you can organize the laundry list. It invites you to align again and empower your team with very clear roles and responsibilities. Another key tool that I'll actually take you through in detail tonight is an accountability chart, which is really like a, a nuclear version of an org chart that's hugely effective. It invites you to implement clearer processes from a sales, marketing, and operations perspective. Often founders have processes in their heads that they actually don't share with people. We don't realize it. We just do. And we don't actually dump it out on paper or anywhere physical or literal for a new employee or another team member to start doing as well. And finally, accountability and support to ensure that the machine is optimized. Okay, any questions at all that have come about from just this brief introduction to a business operating system? And Alina, let me know if anyone's, I can't see anybody. Um, it doesn't look like there's anything on the chat, but you're welcome to pop any questions as we go along in the chat. Um, or if you do have something you'd want to vocalize, just raise your hand or just really jump on and be like, question on So let me know. Okay, Golden yeah. has a question. Golden has a raised hand. Go to the last slide, please. Yeah, the most recent one? Yeah. Yep. Um, so with the first one, identifying and solving systematic operations, um, as a business coach, how do you, I guess, let your client know that they need to do that? I don't know if I'm exp if I'm saying that properly, but how do you let your client know that you have a problem and you need to identify? It? Because one thing I have experienced with my clients is they're really, um, they they don't. They're like delusional almost, meaning like they think it's something else that will solve the problem, but it's really these little, small, simple, impactful things that will create a change in their foundation. So I want to know, like, how do you handle that? Um, I guess I work with an EOS. So with EOS, it invites, um, I invite my clients to actually brainstorm issues in their company. And it's interesting when they often will outline the effects of a problem, the results of a problem, but then it takes a whole other level of workshopping and discovery to find the root cause of the problem. So we use a system of identifying, defining, and then solving the problem itself. So often it's superficial. You know, We keep delivering things late. We don't know how it's happening. We just can't deliver anything on time okay, let's figure out why, what's the root cause of you delivering things not on time. So I found that cl clients and, and found owners, you know, every owner of a company has a sense of what's not working and whether they want to announce it or not, then that's their prerogative. But um, especially when you get leadership team involved, uh, if there's an open space and communication and there's trust and we make a safe space for everyone, everyone can find issues, many issues. It's finding the root cause of that issue that ends up being the next level of discovery as a coach. Yeah, well, so okay, no problem. Okay, so uh, types of growth. So I sometimes will get clients when I talk about growth saying, oh, we've got more clients that we can deal with. We can't take orders anymore because we'll be we'll be late on our deliveries. Um and my response is always, okay, that's a, that's a specific type of growth. So maybe you don't need any more revenue. Maybe you don't need any more clients, but could you serve to make a better profit on the work you're currently doing? 
could maybe you go on holidays for four months and have your team just do the work for you? Like, would that be pr productive? Would that be felt, would that feel like life growth to you? And most often the answer is, oh yes. Um, so there's different kinds of growth. Um, and I do believe truly that as a business, if you're not, and I wouldn't say growing, you could also say evolving. If you're not evolving or changing to some degree, you're probably starting to, to wither. Um, you only go, I think, in two directions for the most part. Um, so, but there's lots of different versions of growth. And as a business owner, and this is something that, you know, comes from EOS, but also something as a business coach that I encourage founders and owners to adopt is that really 10% of your time as a business owner should be spent working on your business. And that means not doing the work itself, not producing the product, not doing the day to day, but actually being a visionary, being um, a sales agent, actually moving the business forward in whatever creative visionary way you want to, even if it means spending time daydreaming and imagining and writing what you want in 10 years, you want to be acquired or your food business. You want to be bought by Unilever. Like, what do you want in 10 years? You want to be able to retire. Do you want to be acquired? Do you want to acquire another factory? It's important to have space and time to think about these things so that you can properly steer the ship to success and whatever that looks like. So internal growth, here's some examples of what, you know, internal growth looks like. A lack of internal growth is often a silent killer, I find, in businesses and the, the worst thing for business owners. And it means basically that they're feeling bogged down, they're feeling trapped, they're feeling um, a prisoner to their business in a lot of ways. Internal growth, though, in turn, looks like new systems and tools and processes that are put into place internally that makes the machine work better, that makes you able to do less work, that makes your team maybe able to do less work. Maybe your team's able to go home early or take Fridays off because you found efficiencies within the business or solved problems that were actually holding you back and bringing everyone down internally. Didn't change the number of clients you have, maybe didn't change your revenue, but everyone feels a whole lot happier at the end of the day and they took Friday afternoon off. And that's a win, right? Increase efficiency with clear roles and responsibilities. Often smaller businesses, they want their team to wear a lot of hats. And that's totally legitimate. You have a small team, everyone needs to wear a lot of hats. But as a result, I think small businesses or mid-sized organizations often feel that they then don't need to define roles and responsibilities clearly. And then it gets muddied and people start doing other people's work or the worst thing that happens is when multiple people are doing one thing, nobody does it. Internal growth also looks like delegating the right people to the right task because you know them well and you've done the work and you know who's best in what spot and you know what role is required and what uh, actions are expected in each role. And then finally, it also can look like prioritize acts, actions to increase internal peace, retention, culture, and efficiency. Like my silly example of, you know, having pizza on Fridays and taking the afternoon off. Um, there's probably far better ones, but you guys know what I mean when it feels good, when everyone's rocking and culture feels great, you can play foosball for a while or everyone can go out and have a coffee or whatever because, you know, work's done and no one's feeling stressed. Yeah, then there's, so the there's a question. Yes. Sorry question. to interrupt. There's a yes, question I need a drink anyways. <laughs> Perfect. So Ayad is asking, does internal growth require hiring or dedicating part of your team to implementing those new processes? I mean, not always. Sometimes it's just a shift in sharing your cultural values and adjusting how you operate as a leader. Sometimes it is just some maybe internal management training for your team to adopt some new methodology or mentality. It can look very different in all different ways, to be honest. Um, you know, it could be as simple as one of my clients is a aluminum casting uh, foundry and for them, it could be just a matter of, you know, being more efficient with how they pass files between the engineering team and the production team. That gets muddied and confusing sometimes, and it bothers everyone, and it's frustrating. Fixing that can make everyone's life a little better. So it can look super different for all different companies. Sorry, that was not a specific answer for you, but. <laughs> Got it. Okay, good. And then external growth is the obvious. So, you know, prioritizing actions that really drive profit and lead to productive expansion, whether that's, you know, we want to expand overseas, we want to add another building, we want to produce a new line of a new SKU or a new line of products. Um, it builds systems and processes that help you scale and expand your team. You know, this is the obvious. Um, but having a clear vision of where you want to go in one, three, and 10 years 
will help you make that roadmap. So having a future vision that's really clear and defined is super important to helping you achieve that external growth that you might want. And then finding the right people in the right seats. So making sure you have the right people doing the right roles, making sure that person has the ability, um, they want it and they have the capacity to do the task necessary in that particular role. And then finally, you're holding everyone accountable to growth deliverables. So if everyone's held accountable, if everyone has a number that they come to the team meeting with every week, you know, you know that productivity is happening as a leader. And if it's not, that's okay, but let's figure out why and solve that problem. So when we think about business operating systems, EOS in particular, and that's the one I really like to work with normally, accounts for six key components of a business or six key systems you could call it within a business. And when all the systems are operating with ease and each component is supported, you have a well-oiled machine is the theory. So I'm gonna take you through those six compo components, <coughs> sorry, those six components right now and you'll get a sense that when they all work together, you can see how, ooh, the, the company probably is pulsing and working quite well. But if one of those systems is falling short, or one of those components or fractions of the business is failing a little or really struggling, it can bring the whole machine down. And the concept with the OS is that if each of the six components are operating at at least 80% capacity, or 80% functionality, or if you gave it a score of one to 10 and it got an eight, then you're doing pretty well. So first, as mentioned a few times, and I will chirp this again till the cows come home, having a vision for your company is essential. And it doesn't have to be a complicated one. But really a good vision offers direction and a plan for the future of your business and ensures that your business objectives are achieved and ensures you have a defined ro roadmap to inspire and direct your team. <clears throat> the analogy I like to use is, um, you know, if you have your team uh, macheting a road through the jungle, or maybe not macheting, maybe they got some vehicles, they're moving through the jungle. You can be there at the front of the crew, walking through the woods and like leader chopping first. But where you'd serve everyone much better and where a vision helps to serve is if there was someone on a top tree looking down on the team and telling them which direction to cut in, right? If there's no one up in the tree telling them which way to go, they could go like this or they could go in circles. So the idea of a good and effective vision for your company from a 10 year, three year and one year perspective helps make sure you always have that vision, that tree, that tree site of where you wanna go. And it helps make your decisions easier. So there are three parts of defining your business vision. And this is a fairly significant component of EOS and quite important. And I'll share it with you today. And you've probably done a lot of these pieces. So hopefully it'll help you when you think about them working together, you can take those pieces of your business that you've already created and put them together in kind of a more cohesive way to make yourself a business vision. So I think of it as three parts. The first is who we are. And that includes four four kind of important things. One is your core values. Most businesses and business owners kind of have at least in their heads and or written out what their values are, especially when you bring on new team members and you're running um, a business with multiple people and employees, having core values is really important. It's important to uh, anchor the team so they understand what's expected of them. It's important for them to um, have a sense of culture. It's also important for them to adopt these values when they present themselves out in the world, whether they're working with clients or doing sales or whatever they might be doing as a, you know, as a representative of your organization. The next is a core focus. This sounds obvious, but it is important for a business to have one primary product or service that they sell. As business owners, we like to tangent. Ooh, we could do this, or we could do that, or we could do that. But it's important to hone in on the thing that is most effective makes you the most profit, that you're best at doing, that your ideal prospects is an easy yes to. So if you have all those things combined, you can kind of get a sense of probably what your core focus should be, that product or service that you're primary focusing on selling. The next is your 10-year vision, as I've sort of alluded to. What do you want to be in 10 years? What do you want the company to look like? What do you want to be doing? Do you want to be sipping Mai Tais on a beach in Mexico? Or do you want to be, you know, buying four more factories across the globe? Like, what does that look like? And you should know 
it can change, but it's good to know now, to have a sense of it. And then finally, business development. So what do you do to bring in business? And this is everything from a marketing and sales plan. I like to call it a business development plan. What are you doing to bring in sales? Because you don't have a business if you don't sell. Second part is where are we going? So what's your three-year plan? What does the business look like in three years? Because three years is not that far away. We like to think about the calendar year, one year, next year, but three years comes quickly. And you may be making decisions this year that are actually going to set you up for success or maybe some risk in three years time because it comes fast. It'll affect the people you hire right now. It'll affect probably spends or investments you make. Now, what's your one-year plan? So what do you need to get done this year? What's your growth target? What are your goals? Everyone probably has a one-year plan, which is great. And then finally, your supporting metrics. How are you actually determining this success? What metrics are you measuring from a pure data analytical perspective? Number of sales, number of product out, whatever that might be. And then finally, how do you get there? And so how do you get there is something that's actually accounted for in a quarter kind of time. So we bite off and chew each quarter. And EOS calls them rocks, but they're essentially quarterly actions or actions or task lists that you know has to get done in that quarter to help you achieve your one-year goal. So what are you doing this quarter? It's easier to digest 90 days at a time than to think of a whole year. So when you think of a task you have to do over the whole year, it feels very difficult. But when you break it up into smaller pieces, smaller to-dos or smaller tasks, you could call it, those become your rocks that you can really bite off and chew this month or next month. So you're breaking down the big projects, you're breaking down the big actions for your team and for yourself into something more manageable. And then finally, issues. So I've referenced this before, but what are the issues in your organization that you feel are holding you back that you need to solve and figure out and wipe away and fix up to really get to your one year or three year goals? The next piece is data. So it's important to always be on top of data, whether that's a CRM system or however you track and measure the success of your company. Maybe it's just QuickBooks, whatever it is to oversee money coming in and money coming out, work being done um, or work not being done as the case may be. So holding your team and yourself accountable to some weekly metrics that will help you assess the pulse and the health of your business on a weekly basis is really important. And it's also important that you account for metrics that are both leading and lagging indicators. So leading indicator is something um, that we often forget. Lagging is easy. How many sales did you get this month? Oh, I got two. Great. Okay, good for you. Uh, oh, I got zero. Oh, that's bad. How did that happen? Lagging indicators are kind of the results. And it's important to track your results, obviously. But leading indicators are the things you do or the things that need to be happening that will result in the lagging results, for lack of a better word. So a leading indicator could mean I have to do at least four sales meetings this month in order to get the one sale that I know I need to get as my goal at the end of the month. I need to go to at least five networking events to get five leads. So I went to five networking events and then I talked to four leads and then I had three sales calls, right? So those are leading indicators that you know will eventually lead to sales and success. So what are that's just one specific example, but you can probably think in your business, what are some of your leading and lagging indicators and metrics that you would want to track? So tracking data on a weekly basis allows you as a leader to not only see what's coming down the pipeline, but also track issues in real time. So for example, I'm working with one of my clients who um, is a um, capital mortgage company. They have a number of agents. So we have leadership meetings with the agent team on a regular basis. And it's easy to recognize if you're inviting your entire agent team to track their leading and lagging indicators. If they have not met their leading indicators for the last three weeks, you can probably be safe to say they're not going to achieve their sales quota by the end of the month. And you're not waiting until the end of the month to find that out as the business manager or leader of that division. You're seeing it happen in real time. And then you can start to have those conversations a lot earlier before it's too late and you miss the eight ball. So you can see trends start to, and you can start to course correct them in real time. Next are issues. Talked about this, talk about it again. Issues are often the biggest thing holding organizations back. And I hate to, like, issues seems like a negative word, but it's just like those things that are holding you back and causing problems and feeling niggly and bothering everyone on a day-to-day -day basis and just just holding you back a little. And, and really, if you invite a team to come up with issues, you'll have a whole lot. Um, 
And so it's dedicating that time to find time to actually solve and put into play solutions in the business right away to solve those issues, to make them go away. And simple, you turn them into to-do lists for your team and you disseminate the actions once you solve the problem or come up with a solution and you task everyone to go about um, doing it. Process. I touched on this already, but often as a business owner and leader, stuff's trapped in our heads. And so it makes it hard to onboard new people. It makes it hard for maybe new team members, especially senior leader team members, to really have a sense and the opportunity to really swim. Um, you're kind of throwing them in the deep end often without water rings. But if you're able to define some clear processes and document it for your team, even if it's simple or complex, it doesn't matter, but it's something that's written there for them to actually bite off and chew. And it also makes sure that everyone is doing the same thing that everyone doesn't have a different way of doing sales or a different way of, you know, making this particular product. There needs to be some defined processes in the organization. And it's often too late that businesses, when they hit that ceiling, when they're feeling the pain and the confusion that everyone's facing of not knowing what they're supposed to do when, that they realize, ah, we don't actually have a way of doing sales calls that we've actually taught and defined to anyone, right? So that's just one example. Or we don't have a way of tracking whether people come late to work or not and holding them accountable. And sure enough, everyone shows up late most of the time. That's a problem. Let's build a process of how we actually track people's arrivals and hold them accountable to coming on time. So defining processes is really valuable. And here's a list below of just, you know, all the different categories and types of functions in your business that could have defined processes. Next is people. I mentioned the accountability chart. It's probably one of the best um, business operating systems and specifically EOS tools that exist. And it's really building your company based on the roles that are needed to make it function most effectively. So when you're building your accountability chart, and I'll talk about in the more detail actually in a moment, you're inviting, I mean, we're inviting you as a leader and with your business leadership team, if you do have a co, um, you know, co-owner or a small leadership team to decide what the business needs to achieve in three years and then to build a structure based on the roles and responsibilities you need, you know, need to exist to get there. There are no people involved. No one has a, no one has a role. No one has a job. They're just jobs without people attached. Then when you define those, then you can put the right people in the right seats. So you're building a business without ego, you're crafting the business without attachment, um, you're looking at it like a machine. What pieces of this machine need to exist for it to operate at optimum capacity? And then finally, traction, which is kind of the bigger function at the bottom here. And this includes essentially mastering the key business operating system tools. <clears throat> Sorry, I haven't talked straight for 40 minutes in a while and I need water. If we have any questions too, feel free to punch in. <clears throat> so with traction, the idea is you have a series of tools that are gonna help you do all the things I've just been talking about, achieve the things that I reference that you can achieve when you adopt a business operating system in your organization. So some of the key tools here are the accountability chart, making something bigger and better than an org chart. Having level 10 meetings, they're called, which are weekly meetings with your team. That can be at the leadership level, but it also can be cascaded and should be cascaded down to a functional level. Quarterly and annual planning sessions, a weekly scorecard that's addressed in your weekly meetings, and finally, clear and defined and communicated processes to the entire organization, which offers clarity and visibility to how you do things at your company. So I'm gonna share with you guys a takeaway exercise, if you like, to how to build your own accountability chart. I find that when I'm talking to businesses, this feels like the one that everyone can anchor on first. Obviously it takes quite a bit of time to actually adopt and implement all of EOS, but this is a tool that I think you can actually take away and maybe start to chip away at as a homework assignment, if you like. <laughs> so it's called an accountability chart. It sort of looks like an org chart, but it's not. It's also, keep in mind, not to be meant to be hierarchical at all. So what is an accountability chart? I refer to it as a supercharged org chart. Supercharged in that is 
it's way more effective than a regular old org chart. First, it ensures that you clearly define the roles and responsibilities needed to optimize your organization. So you have a role and then you have four or five responsibilities that that role is responsible for achieving in that business. And it's creative objectively. There are no people involved. You build it based on a machine that you know you need to create. You don't know who's going to run it yet at all. So again, five primary responsibilities for each of the roles. And again, it's not hierarchical. It really is meant to be a framework versus a who's in charge of who type of structure. And all charts are different. So I'm gonna give you a framework of how to build one, but you need to then go to town building it in a way that works best for your organization. There's no single way to create an accountability chart. All organizations are unique. So it needs to be really created right for your company. But the objective is to have clear accountability and roles and responsibilities that can be defined then for your team. Now, in, in practicing an accountability chart, you do need to recognize a few truths. So you need to accept these as truth so you can really win at your accountability chart. And they're pretty obvious ones. I don't think it takes a whole lot of uh, a stretch to recognize, oh yeah, that's pretty logical, that makes sense. So the accountability chart accounts for three core functions that make up all organizations. Everything descends from these three core functions. And it's sales and marketing, work coming in, leads coming in, prospects coming in, clients coming in, whatever, pick your poison in terms of your name and term that you want to call it. Business in the machine, feeding the machine. Then you have the middle is operations. You're doing the work. You're making the stuff. You're putting out the product. And then at the tail end, you have finance, the part that's overseeing the money flowing in and out of the business. Money flows in, money flows out. You're buying resources, you're paying invoices, you're getting paid by your client for your product. In and out. And ideally, you want that in and out to be balanced in a positive way versus a negative way. So three key functions of the business. It also recognizes that above these three functions, there needs to be a level of leadership that ensures synergy and growth. And those are broken up into two parts. Now, if you are a sole business owner, often you're wearing both hats. If you're a partnership, sometimes partners will do this exercise and turn to each other and be like, oh my God, I know which one you are. Oh my gosh, I know which one you are. And that's really a sweet deal. Um, or sometimes you find business owners who are one of the two, and then they really need to hire another member of their team or up-level a number member of their team to fill in these two other roles. And so those two roles are, first is the integrator. The integrator is like a GM or CEO. They're the person that's truly overseeing the day-to-day -day accountabilities of the three core functions. They're making sure the machine is running. They're usually fairly detail oriented, they're good people managers, they're on the ground. They're not in the weeds, they're not doing the actual work necessarily, but they're leading the team. They're like the general contractor of the business. So they lead and manage, they're held accountable, they oversee the PL, they oversee processes and operations, and they oversee the daily logistics of the company. The next piece is the visionary. The visionary is usually often a founder. Um, but it's nice if a founder is also naturally an integrator. But this individual is more um, the thought leader. They lead the big sales accounts. They often spearhead culture. They often have a thousand ideas a day and then push it down to the team to figure out what's garbage and what's not. Sometimes if they get too in integrated and they get their fingers in the operations of the business, they're just messing things up. So they're better off to stay doing in their lane, doing what they love, and that is being the visionary working on the business versus in the business. So sometimes you have owners of mid-sized companies that are visionaries by nature, and they're really struggling in that integrator role. And it's just hard for them because it's not what they like to do and it's not what they're good at doing. And so doing accountability chart will help you as a leader also recognize what you're good at and what you like doing too. The next truth is recognizing and, uh, and accepting the fact that there can only be one person in one seat. So when you make your accountability chart and define all the roles or all of the pieces of the machine, you can't have two people doing one job. 
When more than one person is accountable for one role, no one's accountable. That being said, one person can do multiple roles. So you as the owner of your company with maybe two employees, you're all doing a lot of different roles and you're wearing your sales hat and then you're wearing your integrator hat and then you're doing your finance hat and battling with the bank or doing something on QuickBooks. You're wearing a lot of hats, but it still serves you well, especially when you're small to recognize that there's a difference in those hats. And especially when you're having a new hire, often mid-sized companies will want a senior leader to come in and they are expensive. You want someone who is, you know, capable, has experience, um, and you also need them to do four different things well. They need to wear four different hats. They have to do four different roles. It's important to know what those roles are so you set them up for success. And they can recognize themselves, ooh, like that fourth role, I'm not gonna be that great at. And you as a leader can know, okay, good to know. Let's have you do it for a while and then we'll try to get you some support, right? But if that's not defined, that person just looks like they're not doing their job right or they're not wearing all the hats or they're not a unicorn because no one's a unicorn. So it's good to know what kind of unicorn you have. And then once you get everyone placed in their roles, you built your accountability chart, you built the machine, you start putting people in their spots, you can start to see if that's the right person for the right seat much more clearly. And use three ways to analyze this. And you can do this tomorrow when you're looking at your team and thinking about the jobs or the roles they're currently doing. Do they get it first and foremost? Do they have a deep understanding and a natural ability to do that job, right? You're naturally a sales shark or you're not. Like people are great at sales and they're very personable and extroverted. You're not going to be that person if you're, uh, you know, an analytical, introverted, maybe scientist, right? Like that's a different, you're not going to get it. <laughs> and nor would that salesperson get being a, a data analytical based scientist, right? So they need to actually get the role itself. But then they need to actually want it. So it's one thing to be a shark and to be great at sales. It's another thing to be like, I'd really like to do creative stuff. I don't want to go out there and sell. I'd like to do something else. Um, so they have to like the job. They have to be open to doing it based on fair compensation and responsibility. And finally, capacity. And this is a key one that's really important to recognize. And you'll start to feel it yourself when you do this accountability chart and realize that you're in like seven of the boxes. And you'll start to realize, oh, God, do I have the capacity to actually do this? Maybe this is why I work on Saturdays and Sundays. Maybe this is why I can't go on vacation. Because you don't have the time, but maybe also the mental, physical, or emotional capacity to do it. You know, don't put me in a role where I have to lift a whole lot of heavy boxes. I'm a very thin, not very strong person, and I would be very bad at that job. So just making sure if you do have a more, you know, product-based um, company, you know, you need to make sure that people are physically comfortable, mentally capable, and emotionally able to do that job. They're whole people we're dealing with, so we need to account for that. So in terms of how a business operating system works, and I'll get to this in a sec, but I want to ask if there were any questions in the interim about anything I've shared so far, the accountability chart perhaps, or anything about the six core functions. So interesting uh, conversation happening in the chat regarding the accountability chart that you shared. Um, Wendy wanted to know if the visionary and integrator can be can one person be both are they interchangeable yeah they definitely can so they can definitely be the same person especially as the founder most likely that is you and you probably have a sense of what you're maybe better at or what you like doing more which is good to know it'll give you a sense of as you grow maybe your 10-year plan is i need to hire an integrator or i would really love to find a mentor who could maybe come with me and be my visionary because that's not really my thing or maybe you end up finding an employee or someone in your team who really is a visionary and they become that role. It looks like it's one on top of the other, but it's really not meant to be hierarchical. It's just kind of structured like that to be able to see it. So often when you're partners, those those boxes are side by side. So you can Perfect. definitely and then, Great. And then Alyssa, you spoke about wearing multiple hats and as early stage founders, uh, they have to wear multiple hats when they're at a stage where they're not hiring team members. Uh, do you have any tactful tips on how they can do that and how to streamline processes while they have to do sales as well, marketing, day-to-day -day administrative work, how to tackle that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a matter of if you're just literally on your own, like Soul, 
So we'll go with that as an example for, I mean, that would be my business. For example, I just work as a coach and consultant on my own. And I think of it as what are the most productive things right now to drive business? So you're really spending your time and energy doing most things to drive the business and also deliver effectively for your customers. So it, for, for a sole proprietor on their own, it ends up being a matter of, you know, choosing what feels most needed in the business right now. Do I need to build my pipeline? Do I need to really deliver enough my ante for my clients right now? So that's kind of, and there's always an ebb and flow. Sometimes you'll be like, I need to focus more on pipeline. Sometimes it's more I need to deliver for my clients right now. I need to be there. Um, and then, I mean, the other things in terms of stuff like QuickBooks, accounting, web management, marketing, execution, even maybe sales, if you need you. help with that outsourcing can be hugely valuable. So seeking experts, professionals, coaches, consultants who can fill that role that you're not that great at and that kind of wrecks you. Um, that's my thing. If it makes me want to bang my head against the wall, I'm outsourcing. So I recommend if you have the capacity to do that, it's worth the investment. That makes sense. Thank you. I think Alyssa, you can continue. Those were okay. the questions. Chat. Great, perfect, great. I see one here. Does internal growth require hiring or dedicating part of your team to implementing those? Oh, that was a question. Great. We answered that already. Perfect. Okay. We'll keep rolling. So the idea with the business operating system is that it really is a system that has a life cycle. It's something that you start to live and breathe as an organization. And there's different key touch points as you go along. Um, and I'll caveat too. Like, I don't know why I didn't say this at the beginning. I'm sorry. Um, so the book traction I have right here, and I'll put it up in the chat. It's a great one. I really encourage everyone to read it. It's backwards right now, obviously, but it's by Gina Wickman. It's called Traction. I, I recommend everyone read it. It's a really great introduction to a good business operating system. Um, and it will expand on a lot of the concepts that I've shared here tonight. <clears throat> but the idea is that you're tapping in with your team to do planning on a regular basis. So you have weekly meetings, very important. These are defined structured agendas really specific, tight weekly meetings that have an objective and a really clear purpose and a formula to them. So it's not just sitting around, okay, let's do this, let's do that, let's talk about stuff in circles sometimes. The system, the structure of the level 10 meeting prevents you from um, going on tangents. Then EOS recognizes too that businesses operate in quarters, that people can only maintain concepts or ideas or make to-do lists for about 90 days. Um, and that's sort of the philosophy of EOS. So every 90 days, you're revisiting right. your goals, you're revisiting your targets, and you're revisiting your to-do lists or your rocks. So you're doing planning sessions each quarter. Most businesses only do planning sessions once a year. And most businesses probably do team meetings like once a month. And that, I would argue, is not enough to keep a pulse on your team and on your business help people feel empowered and also hold them accountable. So all these touch points help to keep you as an owner well aware of what's going on in your business, uh, well aware of what's going on in your business, and also keeping track of if anything's going off the rails really fast. Because you don't want to find out something went off the rails before it's too late, before the shipment didn't get out, before the client's angry, before you're in the red for that quarter. You need a way of being on top of it before that happens. Uh, Alice has a question in the chat. Yeah. Oops, more questions. I think is a weekly tracker more beneficial than a scorecard, or is it uh, beneficial to adapt both as processes? Oh, so um, now is this referencing EOS concepts directly from an L10 meeting, or is this just a weekly separate? I'm not sure what. Um, just if you don't mind giving me some details of your weekly tracker and what that looks like versus a scorecard, because they feel a little similar to me, or how are they different? That would be helpful if I could know. Alice, do you want to unmute yourself and clarify? There. Hi. Can everybody hear me? Hi. Hi. So for the weekly tracker, for me, it would be like more deliverables, right? And non negotiables of things that I just have to get done. Um, or the team it needs to get done, whereas a weekly scorecard would be based on those deliverables or on sales, for example. Because um, I was kind of confused as to how you would adapt those both in your in your process. 
Yes, thank you. Um, I ha I am not getting into detail in what happens in an in an L10 meeting or a level 10 weekly meeting, but that is actually addressed by that. But I'll I'll clarify it now. Um, I would combine the two, and I would call them your weekly scorecard. Um, and it would be a combo of leading and lagging indicators. So what actually has to get done now? Sorry, and I will I will preface it's not a to do list of actually getting the work done. So for example, if you're an ad agency, the actions that are happening amongst your team to get a new campaign out for your client happen somewhere else. That happens in Monday.com or whatever platform you and your team uh, use to get the work you're doing done. So the concept of a level 10 meeting is more about um, taking yourself up and out of the client and project work and doing actually the work on your business. So it would be, we need to um, do four more meetings with um, this client to get new sales, or we need to actually um, get X number invoiced in terms of new projects done. So the actual day-to-day -day work is not really discussed um, in terms of client execution or service execution or product execution. It's more of, uh, business planning is what's done at these meetings. Does that does that clarify it? Yes, thank you for the clarity. I appreciate that. Yeah, and some you're right. Thank you for asking that question because sometimes it gets muddied because we uh, a level ten structured meeting invites you purely as a leadership team to think about the organization, the operation of the business itself. So it's in no way about outputs for clients or you know fixing this machine or this particular process in our in our juice plant or whatever. It's that's not I mean, one of the issues could be the juice plant is broken all the time or, the, you know, this is a stupid example, but like our juice maker is broken all the time. That's an issue that would be addressed by the leadership team in the level 10 meeting. But in terms of your metrics, it would be bigger, uh, larger targets um, that you're going after on a weekly basis for the business health and success overall. Another good example of that too, with what a uh, weekly, you know, measurements or scorecard would look like would be if you're an owner and you were trapped on a desert island and your team could only send you a telegram with five key metrics. So you would know if your business is tanking or surviving, what would those metrics be? And it wouldn't be, you know, did we finish that, you know, um, second round of draft to creative feedback for this client? It would be, you know, what's our what's our revenue this quarter? What's our revenue this week? How many sales calls has my business development person done? Yeah, good, good question. Thank you so much for that and, and clarify that for everybody. I think there's another question in the chat. Um, when is the best time to hire employees? Is it to hire employees in different positions at the beginning of the business or when the business owner has to set out the process of each role by himself? Um, well, it's a little different for everyone, but I think doing an accountability chart will actually help you determine if you should employ someone or not, because it helps you recognize what the roles are. And then you can see, Ooh, this role is actually someone that I could, a role that I could hire a junior person for. Maybe I could hire a summer student to do that. And if I set them up for success, they could do a great job. Um, so doing the accountability chart, I think, well, actually it helps people figure out when and how and which roles they should hire for. So I would start there, to be honest, that would be my my process that I would go through and how I recommend clients consider hiring. Um, and I also find that it's a space when if you're scared to hire a more senior level person, it's at that point when you look at your accountability chart and realize what role am I doing of the 10 roles that I'm doing that's really wrecking me right now that I can't keep doing anymore. And at that point, you kind of have this realization of, okay, I think it makes sense to hire for this now. Yeah, does that perfect. help answer? Please let me know if that isn't um, enough, and I'm happy to. <clears throat> I think we have a, a hand up somewhere. Golden. Yeah, Golden, go ahead. Oh, okay, love the answer. But what about finances, right? When you're first starting up a business, wouldn't it first be um, feasible to think about how much money you're generating to pay that person? Or for example, I think if you were to hire a sales and marketing person, I'm sure they can quadruple income and profits once they're hired. But what about the beginning stages of having that financial stability to hire out when you're starting out? 
Yeah, that's totally fair. I think it's always a calculated risk. So I'll caveat that. And yeah, sorry, I'm going to go with the assumption that you never hire someone if you aren't quite confident that you could at least sustain, you know, their compensation for a certain amount of time. So business, you're totally right, does have to be at a certain level of um, in the green and money coming in and profit existing for you to be able to really invest in a person. Um, but where am I going with that? Um, I just lost my train of thought. I hate when that happens. Um, circle me back if you can, Golden, with your final um, point you asking made. about finances and funding a new hire when you're a startup. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Oh, that was where I was going. Sorry. Oh my God. It's seven o'clock. My bedtime's eight, you guys. Um, okay. So I would recommend to outsourcing as much as you can. So looking at fractional support, looking at um, maybe a lot of companies when it comes to execution tasks, will seek out summer students. And it's always nice to hire young people um, as best you can. Sometimes it can be a matter of if it's more senior leadership seeking out a mentor. So maybe you can't hire another senior level executive because that's just a very high investment. Maybe it's a consultant or a coach or a mentor that can help you do that. Um, but I think doing as much as you can in terms of contracts and part-time or um, co-op is a nice way to start to get your feet wet with employees. Thank you. For help, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. We'll keep rolling. I, I we don't have too many too many slides, so we're on time, and we should have almost the hour to do Q and A's if that works. Although we're kind of in between doing that, anyways. But um, okay, so I've caveated this again a little bit, but I'll do it again. So a business operating system, especially one like EOS, really works if you adopt it fully and holistically. And it's nice as a small business to be aware of it because as you grow, you can slowly really start to integrate it with a team it's hard to do on your own for example i don't fully practice eos just me here in my attic because <laughs> it's not a system that's made for just me but i do make rocks i do have um you know tracking sessions i do check metrics so i do it as best i can as a solo um proprietor right now but as soon as you get even a partner even a partner it adds a level of complication where something like a business operating system will serve you very well and especially if you have any plan on growing or expanding your team in the next six months to a year, I highly encourage you to start practicing some business operating system techniques um, so you can bring it fully into play as you grow. It often is found that it's harder to adopt when you're a mid-sized organization that's already drowning or you're struggling as a founder, and then you have a lot of people that you need to now shift and change to adopt a new system and that's harder than actually starting with it organically from the beginning but if you are at a mid-stage already you know you have 10 employees or 20 or 50 it is totally um do it beyond doable to implement a business operating system but if you do you need to do it hol holistically you can't you can't have to it. um and i like the analogy of baking a cake it's kind of like you know, you can sub in applesauce for oil or coconut oil, but if you don't do the eggs, you're not going to have a cake. So you're not going to see the results of a good business operating system if you half implement it or half do it. And it means that everyone on your team really needs to be on board and practicing it and living and breathing it. And then it will, will, it will serve you incredibly well and lead to astronomical internal and external growth. I've seen it with existing clients and obviously Traction is quite an old book. So you can go online and Google all kinds of insane testimonials, but it really is a bit of a all in or all out kind of situation. But that being said, you can also take tools like the accountability chart and play with them and use them now. So some of the tools are nice to be able to practice outside of the larger system. So finally, this is a sense of sort of what implementing it looks like. And I encourage you to, you're going to all get this deck and it's nice for you to have because, you know, if you are at a stage where you do have a larger team or, you know, even five of you, you can start to do this implementation process yourself. So the first part is really getting an understanding of what a business operating system summary is, introducing your team to it, getting everyone kind of warmed up to the idea of, hey, guys, we're going to start to do this and we're going to start to actually do it on a weekly basis. We're going to practice these things and it's going to be our new MO. Um, you're going to start to work with the team to create tools and processes and define some expectations. So just setting them up to get a sense of what it is. 
Next, and I like to do about a month of this when I work with clients, and I encourage you to do so too if it feels like something you want to actually adopt. And in that first month, you're really building the vision. So you're doing those three steps of who we are, where we're going, and how we get there. You're learning all the tools that EOS has to offer, and you're talking to your leadership team by having some strategic L10 sessions. The next piece in month two, now that you've got your level 10 meetings going on a weekly basis, you have that business vision in play, then you're actually, as a senior leader or as a founder of your organization, actually serving to really implement the tools in real life. So that includes defining your key processes. What's our sales process? What's our operations process? What's our HR process? How do we onboard new people? What are we going to do with them? What are we going to say with them? Do we take them out for lunch? I don't know. Let's do something. Let's make a plan. So they have a great experience. And it's the same for everyone. So it doesn't seem like Bob, who we hired last month, got a lunch, and then Susan didn't, and then someone feels bad. That's a bad, simple example. But it's one that represents if there's a process and not a process, it can make a big difference. You're going to have facilitated leadership meetings at a functional level. So once you define it as a, as a senior leader team, if you're big enough, then you have a sales L10 meeting and an operations L10 meeting. So it brings the whole system down across the whole organization. And then once you implement it, usually again, six months to a year to get everyone sort of comfortable with it and practicing the tools, then you really are self-sufficient. And anyone you're onboarding learns the system right away. Your senior leadership team lives and breathes it, and it becomes an integrated part of your business. So it doesn't feel hard anymore. EOS is interesting in that it's very simple conceptually, um, but it can be very hard to actually implement because it takes a lot of um, you know, dedication and support on all fronts to make it really happen. Okay, that is the last slide. Um, as a final note, the URL code here is my LinkedIn. Please find me. We can be friends. Um, and I like to offer um, some chats to people uh, after this. If you are interested in chatting more about business operating system tools or implementations, there's a lot of information. So, um, you know, feel free to find me on LinkedIn and touch base. And I'm happy to, um, you know, connect again because you're in this program and because you spent the time to learn this. And I just want to add that little extra bit of support because I know this is sort of hitting the tip of the iceberg in some ways. Thanks, Alyssa. This was really eye-opening and very, very needed as well. Uh, we're going to start taking questions. So you can raise your hand or pop in your questions in the chat. I see Alice is ready with a question. So Alice, you can unmute yourself. Hi. Um, so I have a question. As a startup with no employees, for example, um, I understand the importance of business um, outsource processing, right? But if you don't have a lot of money, what's a creative way? Like, would you make a strategic partnership and then maybe offer them portions of revenue just so that you can gain that traction as a founder and focus on the things and like kind of be in your sweet spot and be in your skill set? Um, like, I'm, I'm wondering about creative ways to, with no money, to actually have partnerships and have people on board, right, um, before all of that, just to kind of get that system down. Do you have any, like, recommendations for that? Yeah, I mean, I think it would be a matter of finding a partner in some ways. I think sometimes, well, one example, and again, it's kind of a broad question, but I'll give you some examples if that helps. Like, one thing you could do for, um, you know, driving new business is let's say you're again, an agency or you're a web developer, you know, maybe you could build a partnership with a larger agency that you can pass projects off to, right? So you have this kind of white labeled relationship. So you often have a bit of synergy in kind of making your business seem bigger by white labeling or partnering with another. Helping? So you can do yeah. more services okay. Okay. No, for uh, your clients, um, but they're not all in house. So that's one example. Um, I don't know if you want to share something specific, but um that's kind of one of the ways you can do it. I mean, you could also seek out mentorships. So I'm a mentor with Futurepreneur. Um, it's a great mentoring organization. Obviously, this organization, you know, what what YSpace is doing is fantastic too. There's great mentors probably here um, as well. But as an example, I do know Futurepreneur will actually hook you up with a uh, an expert in a particular industry and they become your like coach or mentor. And it's I think it's completely free. 
that's actually very helpful. Um, I went through WeHub, um, I'm doing this, and I'm just out of the age range for a futurepreneur. I'm 42, um, and I think it ends at 39. So oh it's no, kind of I'm sorry, that's annoying. bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that for as as startups, like we really have to look at the importance of networking and strategic partnerships because it's hard to outsource any business just so we can get that traction. I feel like I have to wear all these hats and some things I have absolutely no clue how to do. And it keeps me stuck, right? It's a fundamental issue for me that makes me feel like I'm just quagmired, right? It's just, so I'm looking at creative ways to um, really partner with other people and to kind of move the needle forward um, and get yeah. that traction. So totally. yeah, learning curve is hard. steep. It it's is. true. And <laughs> finding really, is. I call them like biz buddies. So finding fellow, even competitive, like people who are doing what you're doing and just having a shared space. There's lots of value in like um, brainstorming groups between fellow entrepreneurs. You can get a lot of value and just share. We often feel very isolated, I think, as entrepreneurs. Um, but finding biz buddies to share in the the woes or their learnings is hugely valuable. So there's lots of, um, you can even build your own if you meet people you like in terms of a networking group, um, you know, or biz owners, like workshopping kind of group. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. It's, um, you have to get creative when you're starting something up. So yeah, I you totally do. And to some degree you can barter, but part of me is always nervous yeah. about bartering work because it's never an apples to apples situation. Um, it gets you free labor, but it's, I just, I just would rather pay someone for their time and then pay me in cash versus trying to equate the value of something, if that makes Absolutely. sense. Absolutely. And we want to go there as business guilty. owners and we don't have a lot of cash, but yeah, it's kind of a slippery slope. I agree. And then you end up feeling guilty for, you know, saying, Hey, I don't like it this way because it's free. Right. So exactly. And it's a bit of a controversial thing, but I'll throw it out there and it's teach their own. But I also have a series of people I love and refer and there, I would never refer a client to someone who I didn't trust. It would hurt my name. It would damage my reputation. And so if people do that to me in terms of referring someone to me because they know and love my work and appreciate it and trust their contact with me, I like to give referral thank yous or referral kickbacks or referral thanks, whatever that might be. I give a gift as a referral. And Sometimes I can help as a business starting up too, um, because, you know, you then have people who are op operating as friendly sales agents out there for you. Yeah, it's um, your advocates, right? You got to build a network of advocates. So I understand that. That makes a lot of sense. Thank yeah. you for reinforcing that. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can go and play or you can go and look. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. I don't know what's happening here. I'll just I know. <laughs> we have yeah. people. I don't know how to do that. I think there is a way. All right. Sorry, people keep unmuting themselves. That's okay. Um, just to build on to what Alice, you were saying, I've dropped a link for an idea consultation in the chat as well. I would love to learn more about your business and see how we can support you. Um, and I also got direct messages who would want to be business buddies. So maybe dropping like a short oh. intro to what your business is in the chat. So if there's somebody in this group who'd like to connect with you outside of this session, that'll be amazing as well. Yes, I know, Aline, I'm sure you had lots to add to that in terms of ways that you can help everyone. And yeah, I think biz buddies are so great. Like they really are. So <clears throat> as when I do work like this and I meet people as a mentor one-on-one, -on -one, I actually will match make people. <laughs> They're like, you should talk to this person. You should talk to that person. Because we often feel very isolated as business owners. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, you, you can't get enough support. And having like a good support system of fellow founders is very important. Even if it's different industries or different businesses, I think some of the challenges are very similar. Uh, so it's good to have other fellow founders around you. Yes. Uh, perfect, there was one other question. Let me just go up the chat. Yeah, so Golden wants to know, what are some business operating systems to track progress, accountability results? She's aware of Monday, ClickUp, Asana, but are there any other? Um, I mean, I'm I'm not as sure, to be honest. I more The companies that I work with when it comes to processes are usually working with Salesforce or HubSpot or some bigger CRMs. Um, and I don't usually with EOS get into the nitty gritty of their operational platforms. 
I know there's lots of, depending on your industry, tons of tech platforms. So it would depend on your industry in some ways, but I think you're more um, service-based, it sounds like. Um, so yeah, I like, I like ClickUp too. I use that one a lot and platforms change all the time. So to be honest, now I just use a Google doc for my own CRM, but um, that one's kind of good. It depends. Like, are you looking at CRMs or like marketing? There's a, I could go on tangents with platforms. So Golden, do you mind specifying like what systems you're looking for support in? Yeah. That would help. Let's do like streamlining projects. Right now, I personally use the Google workspace system. Uh, which is great. I just thinking ahead in the future um, for other clients, if they need any support and resources in that. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it would depend. I would want to know that client's industry and what they were needing a platform for, to be honest, because you could just, I could just riff on a million different platforms right now of all different kinds. So <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Well, one in particular, they're in um, tech. They're a security and data analyst company, and um, they're just starting up as well. So I just wanted to send over some resources for them to kind of get to know more about streamlining the process and stuff like that outside of what they're already using. Yeah, so I, I would go in that case, I would recommend they do customer journey mapping to start. Because I wouldn't be able to give them an answer or you an answer unless I knew their customer journey map and what that looks like. So how they actually bring in clients, bring in leads and how they move that person through their system, through the machine. Everything from sales process to operations process to out the finance window of invoicing and billing and follow up and retention. So in order to do that, I would do a customer journey mapping with a client to find out what systems they actually need and how to connect the systems together. I'm sorry, that may not be like the answer you wanted, but um, it's almost like I need more information to give platform suggestions. But big ones like a HubSpot will do basically everything you need, I would think. Yeah, okay, good. Perfect. So uh, Golden's giving us a time Okay, job. perfect. Yeah, sorry, it's such a hard question. It's like, ah, it's like, what what color is your house? Or what color do you want your house to be? Or what, what type of house do you want to build? I have so many questions. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, folks, any other questions? Feel free to just unmute and ask away. All right. I think we covered... Uh, so many things. Everybody is just mulling over the content. Alyssa, I do have a couple of questions for you. Uh, my first question is, I think in the previous slide, you had talked about implementation of an operating system. How do you, um, how do you gauge that this operating system is actually working for the business? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> so I think if you are 100% implementing it effectively so it doesn't work if some people aren't doing it if people aren't participating if people are dropping the ball and not doing weekly meetings if they're not adhering to the roles and responsibilities defined in the accountability chart if the balls are dropping because people aren't doing the work um it becomes pretty clear because then the system starts to fall apart and the organization stops doing it um I think that's the most common way in which you can see if it's not working. If you're actually implementing it effectively, um, I've never encountered a company that hasn't seen gains in success. The bigger issue and the obstacles are having the, the energy in some ways to actually implement a new system in the business. And that's kind of a hurdle for everyone to get over, but it really is important. It starts at the top. It starts entirely at the top. If people start dropping the ball, the sales team starts stops doing their L10s or someone else doesn't do a meeting fully according to, you know, the agenda, it's a slippery slope. So it comes from the top to make sure everyone's adhering to the system. And then it works like a well-oiled machine, to be honest. And because you're tracking things all the time, you can start to see where there are glitches and where it's not working very quickly. Um, and the weekly 10 meetings invite you, because you're tracking metrics on a weekly basis and because you're always talking about issues, you're always uncovering where there are problems in the business and where things are falling short. So you see them right away and then you can start to solve them. And part of it could be, you know, we're not doing our L10s right or, we don't understand what a rock is and so-and-so didn't do their to-dos that they're supposed to last week. 
So you start to see it in real time, so you catch it quickly. Got it, got it. And then I guess just a um, follow-up question to that would be, at the beginning of the session, you spoke about leading and lagging indicators. What are some of the uh, most common lagging indi in, uh, indicators that can sort of define how you want to implement the uh, operating system? Yeah, so, um, and these would be more used kind of on a weekly tracking basis, I would say, leading and lagging, but you could look at them from an annual perspective too. But for leading and lagging, I would say, um, like a lagging would be number of sales, um, <clears throat> percentage of product delivered on time that week. It depends on the industry, so I'm just throwing stuff out there. Um, it could be number of deals landed, um, number of invoices paid. However, your system accounts for output success is what you would use as your lagging indicators. And then your leading would be, what are the things that have to happen in order for that output to actually happen correctly or on time or to its fullest capacity? So that could be things like number of dockets in our CRM system, number of new sales calls made, um, you know, number of RFPs presented, depending on your industry. So those are leading indicators, because if you know you've done 10 RFPs in the hopper, you usually have about a 50% success rate of those coming through. You know that likely in six months or whatever, however long your business cycle is, you're going to have four new um, projects paid for. So the leading and lagging work together to give you a sense of what's coming in the pipeline and what's successfully come out. Understood, understood. Yeah. Does that help to clarify it a little bit? And every bit yeah. is so different. So I'm just like riffing on as many examples as I can oh. think of to help give some options. <laughs> no, that helps. Thank you. Um, and then my last question, I know you already gave a book recommendation. Are there any other recommendations in terms of other books or podcasts that yeah. uh, found another one I really like is I'm, I'm gonna pull to my library right here. I've got a few. <laughs> Um, I really like this one. It's kind of like an old school looking book, but it's called um, <clears throat> Smart Calling by Art Sob Shazak. I'll put it in the chat. <laughs> um, and it's a really nice sales book. So if you're feeling apprehensive about selling or driving leads, it's a nice way to approach um, selling and sales because that usually is a big hiccup for, um, you know, founders. Like you're, you're an expert at something. Maybe you have a uh, acupuncture clinic, maybe you are a cabinet maker, maybe you're, a, you know, whatever it might be, you're a therapist. Um, you know, you're not an expert at selling. You're not a shark. You're a therapist, but you still need to sell. <laughs> so it helps. That's interesting. That's a good recommendation. Um, perfect. All right. Those are all my questions. Uh, are there any questions, folks? Art, the weird name, Sub Zach. There's one, and I'll put traction in two. Perfect. Thanks, Alice, for sharing that in the in the chat. Perfect. Alyssa, well, I think we're all caught up on questions. Great. So uh, we can wrap up the session. Thank you so much for sharing your insights, your knowledge with us.